Hi, good evening. Uh, I'll try and keep this very short. I know this is the last talk and everybody is very eager to go to the bumper draw. Well, uh, what is uh, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, adaptive technology in spine surgery? Well, uh, change is a constant that is there. Dr. Chauber and Dr. Tanna were pioneers of spine surgery of their time. I was fortunate enough to be student of Dr. Tanna. And uh, how the wheels have changed over the past 40 years is seen in this patient, a 50-year-old guy who was operated in 1989 when I joined medical school and who presented again in uh, Kokhlaab and Ambani Hospital in 2018, referred by Dr. Chobal, who is no longer practicing now, for a spine surgery. You can see this is his re-herniation and that was the original scar uh, of the previous surgery that was done 30 years plus. The distance traveled in the past three to four decades is this. This is the scar in 1989 for a simple discectomy. And this is the scar for a revision uh, discectomy in 2018. So as we progress, so how does it work? This patient was my first patient I operated on 2nd February in 2017 after joining Ambani Hospital. This, as you can see, is a high-grade list. This is a syndromic patient. As typical in India, they present only when they can't get up and go to the loo. Till that time, they will pull through. We fixed this surgery, but what was different for her was she could squat and sit down in a month's time. So this is how spine surgery has changed. Uh, we have expectations that once the spine surgery has been done, you will never bend down, you will never squat down, you will never lift weight. We can say that several of our patients have gone to international level, Olympic level competitions and won medals there. And how do you improve this even further? How many of you here, I like a show of hands, use Google Maps? Yeah. How many of you used any form of navigation 20 years back? We had a paper map which would tell us where to go. What has changed now is this captures real-time data, tells us what alternative routes you have to go, where you're going to get stuck, and where is the road free. Similarly, what artificial intelligence and navigation does in spine surgery today, it tells you what is the best path to put your screw inside, what is the best length of screw you can put, what is the best thickness of screw you can put, and how is your screw going to be inside once you put it. You can store various uh, levels of screws that you have put in, program your drivers to put them exactly in that case. And how is this achieved? Well, like all uh, sources, you need information. The information, what we have, is through this CT scanner. That's an OARM. That's one of its kind in Mumbai. We are the first ones to uh, get it five years back. It is still the only OARM in uh, Mumbai and for that matter in, uh, in Maharashtra, OARM 2. Uh, this gets fed to this navigation. And then, to put a simple screw in the back, I'm sure all of you have seen patients in whom screws have been put in the back with long scars where the muscles are disrupted. I'm just taking you through this, uh, this thing. This is me marking where to put in a screw. The patient has not been opened up here. This yellow is where the projected path of the screw will be. Blue is where my drill is. And this is how easy is it is to put in the screw. We make a cut. and. As I'm putting it in, you can see the blue marker. I'm piercing the deep fascia going into muscle. You can see the progress real time onto the screen. And that's it seated on the bone. Once it is seated on the bone, you can check for the exact length that it should be traveling. The yellow part is the projected path it's going to take. So that's the measurement of uh, the length that we have done. Once that is done, you just tap it through blindly. You, I'm not even looking at the patient here. I'm looking at the projection the virtual projection of the surgery I'm doing. The next step is where we would be tapping to let make this, get the screw in, and that's the screw going in. How does it help? Just to put in screws? No. As you can see, this is in the cervical spine. Sorry. This is a cervical spine in a syndromic spine where I'm putting in screws inside the lateral mass. That's the vertebral artery here. And I can safely know where I'm going. Same here is in uh, a thoracic spine. This is putting in a screw in a pedicle that is completely sclerosed in an ankylosing spondylosis patient. You can see that's a small gap. The, and it has to be a perfect screw. If you go out, you're going to burst the pedicle out. If you go in, you're going to enter into the spinal cord. So this is how precise the surgery is done. It takes away your... Uh, need to know your anatomy 
very well. So even an average surgeon can become a good surgeon and a good surgeon becomes a brilliant surgeon with that. You can put precision screws as you can see here right up to your, if I go too far, I'll be busting one of the iliacs there or go into the colon. If I put it too short, it's not going to be good enough. Just to show how this works, this is a 60 year old female, uh, I won't say morbidly obese but about 95 kilos and that's her spine, you can see the lysthetic spine. We use a Jackson table, again this is the only one in the country, this is a complete carbon fiber table, it allows the patients especially somebody who's fat like me, the abdomen to be free so that there's no uh, pressure on the vessel. Uh, this was made actually for PG teaching, so I'm going to skip some part of this uh, to the, yeah. So we make a small hole in the patient's back, that's the sign of my index finger. So this is a little thicker than that 22 millimeter uh, entry portal. Uh, unlike abdomen, uh, back is solid muscle and bone, so you have to put a tube retractor before you can put your endoscope, microscope, or exoscope as we use now to visualize inside. So that's the tubular retractor we're using uh, to get into the spine. And that's what you see inside. That's the head end, that's the medial aspect, that's the foot end. This is the pars, and I'm taking a chisel to make a cut here. That's the facet joint. And this is about two and a half centimeters of length. So once that part is uh, mobilized, you take the facet uh, joint, this is a fusion surgery for the spine. Typically we would have opened up the whole back, taken out all the erector spinae away, denervated it, so made it practically useless and uh, made it a very painful uh, de uh, surgery for the patient. Here we are just making a focused entry of where it should be, that's the superior facet uh, here. I'm going to skip through some of the steps here. Yeah. So that's the dural sac, there's no spinal cord at L4-5 level. Uh, that's the ligamentum flavum which has been taken out. What you can see here is the cambium triangle. This is where we go in from, that's the disc space. You can barely put in a 15 number blade because it's a very severely uh, degenerated disc space as you can see there. There are ways and means of getting this disc space to open up. I will uh, skip some, uh, most of the part there because that's not a part you would want to see, yeah, that's the jacking up mechanism. We use several blunt, uh, it's like uh, jacking up a car to change its wheel. Serially from six millimeters to whatever is the ideal height, this uh, puka chisels help us in opening up the disc and bringing it back to its place. And uh, we use curates then to make the disc spaces. That's the last jacking up that we are doing. This is a 13 millimeter uh, jack up that we're doing here. We use again curious to reach to the opposite side, clean up all the cartilage ends so that you have a nice fusion mass that's there inside. Once this is achieved, uh, once the entire bed is prepared, bone graft is put in. So this looks like a very big thing, but actually if you can, that's just my knuckle that you can see on the white gloved hand there. And through this small incisions, you can carry out some of the most complex fusions in the spine. A funnel is used to put in bone graft and that's uh, the bone graft going inside. We used to use this in our village to fill uh, kerosene in uh, uh, light stoves at one time when we were kids. Now we adapted that to fill in bone graft inside the bone uh, canal. So that's a trial cage so that we know what exact size goes in. And that's, uh, that's the final cage going in. This cage is packed with bone graft again so that uh, there is bone growth across it and a fusion occurs. So this much is something that we have been pretty much doing for the past now one and a half decades. What has changed is the part after that. So that's the cage going in. Once the cage is in, we then used to bring up a C arm uh, and through a lot of radiation and uh, some experience try and put in our screws. Once the dural scac is done, this is a tracker on the patient. I have taken the no arm screen and now I am registering my entry points here. What you can see in uh, that was our Jamshedi needle, a small cut there. The Jamshedi needle come drill going inside and this is the virtual projection of what I am doing here. So I now measure the length that's seen in the yellow and then bang that needle inside. 
while doing this i am very sure that i am going on the optimum pathway i am really getting a very very long safe screw and i am not putting the patient into peril for any time and that's the guide wire going over the needle that has gone in there is no radiation whatsoever to the surgical team here patient gets one short segment ct scan radiation and it's a pulsed CRM based uh, 3D tracker, so the radiation levels are a little bit lower than conventional high grade CT. This is repeated at every other uh, area. And then again, we dilate over the guide wire. So this is to protect the muscle from uh, screw teeth and the tap uh, that can traumatize it. Once that is done, we use custom made uh, taps that are there. That's why spine surgeons are called carpenters sometimes. That's what we do. We put screws in the back. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, the advantage of reusing anything. Everything has to be perfect the first time. While I'm doing this, I'm seeing a virtual projection of where I'm going. So that makes it doubly safe. So this is what is most important in the spine. A wrong screw can give you a foot drop, can cause cauda equina, will make you lose your bladder bowel uh, uh, control. So that is... Uh, how safe it becomes once you have a good navigation and that's the screw going in. The yellow part is the screw and uh, the blue one is the ha screw handle. And as it goes forward, I see real time where is the screw moving forward, whether it's in the proper place, whether the adequate length of the screw is inside. Because once you're in, you can't back out the screw. The moment you back out the screw, the purchase of the screw goes down. So navigation ensures that every single time you put in a perfect screw inside. The same step of putting the screw in is then repeated at all the other four sites where we plan to put in screws. It's become that easy. Uh, when we were training in the early uh, 90s, we used to have an x-ray that used to be taken every single time or a C-arm projection. You would end up having hundreds of C-arm projections and dozens of x-rays taken before you put in a screw and that too you are never sure whether things have gone in well. So that's how simple it is to put in a, uh, a rod uh, into the screws. These screws have towers to capture the rod and then you can reduce it inside and it easily goes in. There's hardly any blood in the field. One of the biggest fears in spine surgery was the amount of blood that the patient would lose. Our average blood loss for an uncomplicated fusion is less than 50 cc. In a revision spine surgery, it's about 70 cc, which is fairly low compared to what a conventional spine surgery loss used to be. And this is a very simple instrument. It, uh, it's a quick surgery. You finish it under an hour and a half, and uh, the patient walks within a few hours the moment they are conscious. Yes, uh, it is painful, but it is much less painful than what an open surgery would have been. And uh, the results are, so far, out of the 1,800 surgeries I've done in the past six years, we have had uh, cage-related complications in four. Uh, two, we didn't need to do anything. Two are the patients who had a problem with the cage. So that's like 0.2% complication rate in uh, surgery, which is fairly acceptable and better than most uh, complications that are seen uh, in major institutes in the world. And just to give you how much is the footprint of the surgery, that's how small the cuts are and that's how the surgery gets done. And that was her post-op x-ray. She went to have a full recovery. We are able to do it even in such bad cases of multi-level. This is our anas cardiac anesthetist mother. Uh, she is now one year post-op and doing fairly well. It's not just for screw fixation, but even for tumors like osteoid osteoma, this especially uh, near the conus medullaris where it's extremely difficult to go in. We were able to, I'll just show you the virtual projection. So that is my drill. So while I'm drilling around the tumor, I can see the projection virtually. So I can actually go in and drill it blindly, knowing that I'm in within safe quarters. And that is the end result. Through the small holes, we're able to take out the complete, this is the nidus of an osteoid osteoma, which is usually burnt or curated out. We are able to take it out completely. And it's not a one case miracle. This is another 18 year old boy, another difficult placement. It is just, this is where the nerve root is. And this is just under the pars here. And that's what we did for him. We used navigation, put in a tube, and we were able to take it out. That is how he presented, and that's him once the sutures were taken out. In larger tumors, such as this one, that you can see in the lung, this was asked by one of the largest centers to go home because she was paraplegic. And you can see the large effusion you can have. It was adhering to the heart and the aorta. That's her intraop picture. We went from behind. 
we put in screws this is the part of the chest wall that was taken out up with three ribs and you can see the thoracotomy with the remnant of the tumor stuck to the aorta which uh, was dangerous to remove but most of it we could get it out from there this surgery is more and this is a virtual projection when we were taking out the tumor this is what my microscope is saying you can see the cage that's the marker here and that's the virtual projection so i can actually this uh, take a look at how well is my cage sitting where is it sitting how much of the bone has been to uh, using this feeler virtually rather than having to open up and see it from the front this patient is now nearly three to four years old recovered and doing well well a combination of this techniques uh, this is a brown's tumor uh, in a chronic renal failure that's what we did for him through this small incisions and you can see this is tricalcium phosphate cement vertebroplasty that was done that's his image eight years later this patient recently passed away due to medical complications but he could go for his dialysis within a week of his surgery for nearly eight to nine years that's another 58 year old uh, i think dr somnath and i collaborated on this case when uh, this case had a failed vertebroplasty which got infected we used minimal access techniques to splint him his inr was between 2.5 to 4 during the surgery but still through this holes we managed to put in this screws after which he had a liver transplant post which we went in and revised this guy is back to his business uh, of transport uh, he would never had a chance to live if we had not innovated for him this is another patient from malats uh, 70 year old this fairly common what we see here what we did differently for her was we used the no arm we didn't open the vertebral uh, the spinal canal here at all we went from the side we didn't get into the chest cavity we cho uh, skirted through the pedicle to put in this cage to restore her height so the chances of getting paralysis were zero because we never manipulated inside not that she have the problem of having the chest cavity open and the morbidity associated with it so that that's the intraoperative view to check how is the cage sitting how are the gra is the graft placement adequate is the purchase of the screws adequate it has been extended to several cases this is a revision surgery in a 110 kilo uh, patient bent over like that where we could correct this is another surgery we revised in an 80 year old uh, his only wish was to be able to walk in his native place and that same is now 85 years old we did it when he was probably 82 uh, we can uh, we'll go back to the x-ray with this permission his birth date was 9 uh, 1939 so even old uh, patients we have been operating from 6 months to 94 year olds we have been fortunate enough that most of them have gone back to living lives that they would be happy with thank you for this patient here <laughs>